I am Pastor Keith, the lead pastor here, and it is our privilege to have you worshiping with us here today. <clears throat> I too want to just take a moment to thank my incredible staff for all that they do. Uh, I have the best pastors on staff with me. Uh, it feels like the team is complete, and we're, I'm just so happy and so blessed to have them. Uh, they work hard. Some are part-time, and they're actually put in full-time hours, and some are full-time, and they put in more than full-time hours. Um, we love what we do, and we are so blessed as pastors and families to be able to minister to you, and not just minister to you, but with you, and to be a part of your lives. You are our family. You really are, and we are so blessed to be here. Uh, we are doing a series called The Greatest Story. How many like a good story? Whether it's a book or a movie or somebody reading to you, whatever, uh, I love stories. Uh, we are in chapter four of our series, The Greatest Story. And although the Bible is filled with lots of incredible stories, they all come together to tell one story. From cover to cover, the Bible's the story of God's plan to bring us back into relationship with him through his son, Jesus. All the scriptures point to God's plan to rescue us from our sin through Jesus. And the greatest story draws us into the lives of uh, Bible characters just like you and I, with strengths and weaknesses that we have, and incredible events are like, wow, that's crazy that happened. And also, you are a part of the story. The Bible actually talks about you in, in there. It doesn't have your name per se, but it talks about you in there. So it's great to be a part of the story and actually see that there's still events in the Bible that are still to come and that we are a part of. So Romans 15.4 tells us that for whatever was written in the former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The Bible brings to us hope when it seems as if there's no hope. A couple guys after Jesus' resurrection were walking down the road and they were discouraged because they thought Jesus was the Messiah and now they thought he was dead. And they were just bummed out. They were having a bad day. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears to them. He's walking along with them. They had no idea it was him, but Jesus begins to explain to them all the Old Testament, starting with what Moses wrote and going through the Old Testament. And he points to that and he points to how, it, it, he shows them how it points to the Messiah, to him. And all of a sudden, their eyes were opened up and they saw it was actually Jesus in resurrected form walking with them. And it says their hearts began to burn within them. That's the hope that Jesus brings to us. And it's, it's the story that Jesus told them that we are actually going through. Um, our tagline that we've been saying every Sunday for the series is hear the story, live the story, and share the story. So let's, let's hear it this morning. Let's live it. And let's share it. So in chapter 1, the story began in Genesis with the account of creation. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now on day 6 of creation, God created man. And the Bible says the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. You are made in the image of God. You are unique. You are special. I know all of you are saying, yeah, I'm, I'm special. I'm special. Some of you are too into yourselves maybe, but humbly you can say, I'm special. You are uniquely made. You are made in the image of God. You are created to bring him praise. You are created to do relationship with God. Now in chapter two of the story, we read the turning point of the story as Adam and Eve looked at the forbidden fruit and saw how it was beautiful it was pleasant and it was desirable. And the tempter enticed them into partaking of one of the trees that God had said, do not eat from this tree. And sin entered into their heart and into, into the heart of all mankind and the consequence of sin also came with that. Chapter three, the flood. Noah was a righteous man, he obeyed God, he walked in favor with God and all the other men were wicked. And, and God said, that's, that's it. Just like Popeye, right? That's all I can stand, I can't stand no more, right? And so God said, I'm wiping out man from the earth, except one man was righteous, Noah. And so we built this huge ark. 
And the rains came. They came from the ground. They came from the sky. And it flooded the entire world. And after many, many days, over a year being in the ark, they were able to walk out onto the dry land. And immediately, Noah made a sacrifice to God and thanked God. Now, we want to pick up with that story in Genesis 9, verse number 18. It says, The sons of Noah came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backwards. Imagine that. They're like, okay, we're not going to look at dad naked. So they got this whatever on their shoulders and they're walking in like this. and kind of They must be kind of looking for his feet somewhere. So they're not stepping on, on dear old dad. And they get to that point and all of a sudden they start covering from his toes. And they keep working up so that it's, they're not even looking at him. And they cover him up. Verse 24, when Noah awoke from his from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him. He said, cursed be Canaan. The lowest of slaves will be to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem and may Canaan be his slave. Now even in Noah, the one righteous man, we find sin drunkenness he became drunk and ashamed just like the first Adam who was naked and ashamed Noah was also naked and ashamed and drunk and we see how all of this leads to family issues that will carry out for generations to come now Ham's descendants were cursed it's important to remember this we're going to see this throughout all these different Bible stories So this is where things start to get really like, wow. Ham's descendants were cursed. Japheth's territory was extended. But it is Shem who was truly blessed by his father Noah. And next week we're going to see that the blessing carried through to Shem's descendant Abram. Now chapter 4. The Tower of Babel, or some say Babel. I say Babel. um, Because, you know, you say to somebody, stop babbling, right? Not stop babbling, but it may be Babel. We may just say Babel wrong. I don't know. But at this point, Genesis account, there's this, it's a crazy story. Often called about the Tower of Babel. Uh, Some time has passed since the judgment and the mercy of the flood. But humanity was still broken from the inside out. There was still a sin problem because there was still a heart problem. And sin remained in the people's hearts after the flood. God knew this was true. The flood was only meant to slow down the progression of sin in the world. Well, after the flood, the population had rapidly multiplied, just like rabbits. I mean, they're, they're multiplying, all right? They're just, people are everywhere. And that's at God's command. He said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. So God had blessed mankind in its fresh start, confirming his covenant to Noah, but mankind continued to disappoint God. And one particular group migrated to what is now known as Iraq. It became the center of civilization of the ancient world. Babylon was a summit of human achievement. The people of of Babel or Babel, several generations on from Noah, had developed these incredible technical skills. That's a good thing. God gives us all gifts. He gives us all skills. So the builders of this tower had gained sufficient architectural and mathematical knowledge to undertake a huge construction project. The creator God had given them intelligence and he had given them these abilities, these gifts. They had said, let us build. So they were building it together. But let's go to those verses in chapter 11, verse number one and see what's happening here. It says, now the whole earth had one language and a common speech. Isn't that hard to imagine? I mean, you ever called uh, customer service? <laughs> and, you, and you get somebody on the phone, you're like, wait, wait, I, I can't understand you. 
wait, wait, I, can't, I, I need to call again and hope you get someone that maybe you can understand. So they all had one, one speech, all in common. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used bricks instead of stone and tar for mortar. So they're getting smart on how to build the buildings, how to construct this. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord God came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, man, if, if as one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from, from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel because the Lord there confused the language of the whole earth. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. This morning, when you entered in the sanctuary, I was gonna have the ushers give you maybe like one through 10. Every family got one through 10 or a different color. At this point, this is what we're gonna do, but we're not gonna do it because it'll take a lot of time and, and, and some of you just won't do it anyhow, all right? But I was gonna give you, so imagine, I was gonna give you one through 10 as you came in. And right now, without talking, you were gonna have to raise up number one, and everybody who had a number one would have to go and find those who had a number one. Because if you're sitting next to your best friend, you wouldn't be able to understand them. You'd be like talking all of a sudden, it's like, wait, what? I don't get, what are you saying? What are you saying? But eventually you'd begin to find those that are speaking the same language, and that would become your group. Now I believe that God kept families together, that would make sense. But again, your neighborhood is all of a sudden different. Everything has just changed. So, wouldn't that be fun to just do that this morning? And you're like, I don't like this spot where I'm sitting, but, and who would move and who wouldn't move? But that's kind of how it was. Like, wow, all of a sudden it changed like that. Now, how many have ever played the game Mad Gab? Raise your hand if you've played that game. Okay, I like to play that game. I'm gonna ask uh, Mike Nyson if you'd come on up here. Would you come on up here? All right, I, I've got a couple now. Let me explain Mad Gab to you. Uh, there's usually two teams, but you'll, be, you'll just kind of help them figure this out. Now, what you do is you sound out these puzzles. There's, there's some small words that when you put them together, they make a word or a phrase, okay? So I'm gonna have you say this. This isn't what it is, but they'll hear, hear something else, hopefully. Say those words, there's, there's four words. Say those words, and you try and guess to, to see what he is saying, all right? I'll try to listen to you as best I can. We'll get you a microphone here, Mike. Okay, so go ahead and try and say that so they understand what you're saying. These if hill war. Okay, keep, keep saying it. You gotta keep saying it. Say it differently so they can try and hear it. These if hill war. These if hill war. <laughs> Anybody shout it out if you hear it. What? The Civil War. The Civil war. Oh, so, so say wow. it again like that. Say it fast like you did. Um... <laughs> Now no, you, I want to now say you, the Civil War, but you got it. You got it. All right, so let's go on. Let's go on to the second one here. <laughs> I'm all of mush sheen. What was that? I'm a love machine. Oh, Mike! Oh my goodness, that's just too much information there, Mike. So, all right, thank you. <laughs> wow, we didn't even really know that, Mike, but when, when our family plays this game, when Mark says it, I just can pick up on what he's saying right away. When I say it, it can, but other times people are like, what? And of course, the other team is laughing because they know what the answer is, but this is kind of how I picture the Tower of Babel. I mean, they're just like talking all of a sudden, huh? What are you, what are you saying? What's going on here? Well, the, we recognize that the people did some good things. They, they said, let us, right? They were working together. Let us build this. They were using their skills. God gave, it, gave them skills, so that's a good thing. Use your skills, but they were not using those for God. Let us build this that we can go to heaven, that we can build this for our God. Let's not scatter either. You see, our sin reveals the depth of our rebellion against God 
and our helplessness to do anything to be right with God. But what we cannot do, God has done through Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God who graciously provided to, for us to crush the head of the serpent, the same serpent that caused or that tempted Eve to fall in Adam as well. God isn't against cities and towers, of course, but the architectural self wasn't the issue of that day. It was the motivation behind why they did what they did. It was the wayward heart of humanity that was into self. Let's do this for us. If they had done it for God, it would have been one thing, but they did it for themselves. Let's not scatter like God said. Let's stay here. Let's not do that. Let's build a name for ourselves. You know, sometimes in life we can get caught. We can be doing things together with somebody and using our skills, which is a great thing again, but we can doing all the right things for the wrong reasons, can't we? And sometimes I've found that in my life. I'm doing something, I feel like I'm doing good, and all of a sudden God checks my heart and says, you're not doing this for the right reason. This is all about you, isn't it? Like, what? No, God, really, I'm doing this for you. No, you're not. <laughs> you're doing this for yourself. You're doing this so that you can be seen by men or whatever. You're like, no, really. Oh, God, you're, you're right. I am doing this for the wrong reason. And these guys, were, they were doing that. They were building this huge thing, and they were doing it for the, all the wrong reasons for themselves. You know, it, with the Tower of Babel in the story, the literal meaning of the word Babel is gate of God. The Tower of Babel was man's greatest defiance up to that time against God's authority. Mankind intended to make his own gate into the realms of heaven. At the cross, man showed his greatest defiance against God and his authority once again. But it was at the cross that God met our greatest defiance and by his grace made it the gate where we can have access to him. What man thought would be a great defiance actually God used and the cross became the gateway to heaven. From this point on the Bible, Babylon, which is where we get that name Babylon from Babel, Tower of Babel, represents the anti-God world system which in its pride and arrogance leads man to think that he can dethrone God and has no need for his laws and his commandments. And we see this rear its ugly head again in Daniel with the story of the statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and, and it comes crashing down by the rock not cut with human hands. But again, it symbolizes God's kingdom will always overcome these other uh, kingdoms that man tries to establish and God always has the last words. But there's, there's a further picture in Revelation as well of God's final judgment upon Babylon in the anti-God culture that she represents, which, which you can read on Romans uh, chapter 18, verse 10. But again, this Babylon will one day come down. And again, Babylon throughout the Bible then begins to represent man and man's uh, uh, establishment of what they think they want to do in defiance to God. Now, let me, let me focus in this morning on the heart. What happens when you focus only on the behavioral aspect of sin? and not what is taking place in the heart. See, that, oftentimes that happens. We can focus on, well, what was the outcome of that sin? What, okay, if I have a covetousness heart, what am I gonna do? I might go steal somebody's toy. Or like somebody did to me when I was a young boy, they stole my bike. I had worked hard, I got money from my bike, and I, I didn't do right. My parents had leave in the garage at night, I left it beside the garage outside, the next morning it was gone. Somebody had a covetous heart, and they went and they stole that bike. Well, the, the problem, yeah, stealing the bike is, but you've got to go back to the source, right? The heart of man. The heart of us is where we've got to get back to. What is going on in our heart? How does the truth that God is grieved by your sin influence the way you deal with personal sin or temptation? See, God made men in his image, and he commissioned them to know and live according to his covenant. And God knew that the men of Shinar were moving further away from his plan and from his purpose. But notice here, even though men had again had become like they were in the days of Noah, this time man didn't, God didn't wipe men out. This time, he didn't destroy them. He destroyed their ability to carry out a plan that would cause them to lose sight of their need for God. I'm going to confuse their language. 
we're going to make multiple languages here. And we're going to get them scattering the entire world again and not trying to do things for themselves. Have you ever thought you had a great plan and it fell apart? And then you wonder, well, man, what happened? I, I seem like I did all the right things and this thing totally fell apart. Well, chances are you may have thought you were doing the right things, but you really weren't doing the right things. And as you look back at that, you say, oh, man, you're right, God. I did all of this, thought I was doing right, but it wasn't right. When our eyes open to the reality of sin, to its pride, its rebellion against a good God, and the consequences that it unleashes to those around us, we begin to see God's love and grace in a whole new light. You see, God wasn't obligated to show grace and mercy or even to provide a way to be made right before him again. But he did because he loves you so much. Because he loves you so much. Even though man's heart continued to be wicked and filled with sin, he went to the point where he said, you know what? I'm gonna make the ultimate sacrifice because of my love. I'm gonna send Jesus Christ to come and touch the heart of man and to truly set them free. And that's what the whole Bible is all about. It keeps pointing back to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. The stories that we're going to begin looking at with Abraham and beginning to follow his family line are incredible stories, but they all point to Jesus. Again, what happens if we only focus in on the behavioral aspect of sin and really not what's taking place in our heart? The heart tends to represent the center of us, our essence, who a person is. And it's out of the heart that it begins to direct the things that we do. You do what you do because what's in here. You do what you do because of the things that have happened that you've allowed to get into your heart. So the Bible talks about we need to guard our heart for it is the wellspring of life, right? So it is out of our heart that good and evil can come. And so we ask God to transform our heart, to change us, not what we're, the outcomes. That will change as our heart changes. A- imagine this. Here's an analogy. If we see a polluted river, right? You, maybe you've seen it before. It's one thing to go down river and try and clean the river up, right? And to take care of the things that it's damaging downstream. And that, that's a good thing. That's okay. But it's much better If you continue to travel up the river until you get to the point where you see the source of the pollution and you take care of the source of the pollution and when you take care of that, then you've taken care of the outcomes that come because of the pollution. That's our heart. We gotta get back to our heart and what's in there. For some of you, your heart is filled with pain and it is filled with agony because somebody wronged you. And because that took place, you have this bitterness and you have this rage and you anger. And then sometimes you lash out on somebody else you love that has nothing to do with the person who hurt you. And you're trying to figure out, why why do I even do that? This is the one person who has stood by my side and I treat them like that? What's going on? You've got to get back to the heart, to the source. What's happened? Why do I feel like this? Oh, man, this is why. I'm sorry, it's got nothing to do with you. Forgive me. I gotta get back to what happened here. And you begin to deal with that. And you begin to allow God's love, Jesus Christ, to come into your heart. If you've never done that, that's where it starts. Inviting Jesus to transform your heart, to make you a new creation. That's where it starts. But even as a follower of Christ, things try to get into our heart because the devil doesn't like us serving God. The devil wants to destroy our life. And so he's bringing these things, and some of these things, we we let the guard down, and these things come in. And it may be years later, all of a sudden you recognize, oh my. I never realized that that little thing in my heart would cause such destruction later on. The heart. God wants to touch your heart today. You know, as we're doing this series, I sometimes like to jump ahead to connect something that's gonna happen way down the road with what just happened here. And I wanna just do this before we close the service and talk about our heart again. But I, I love in Revelation chapter seven, as we see the things that are yet to come in this incredible story, 
Remember now, they had one language, and then God gave them different languages, and they're scattered all over then. And that's what God, God wanted them scattered, right? And so in Revelation 7, 9, we see this. It says, after this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All of the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. There was a day that because of language, people were scattered. But friends, there's coming a day in the story when every language will be represented as we gather around the throne to worship God. Not worshiping ourselves as they were doing in the Tower of Babel. It wasn't about them. Now they are now worshiping God. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? We've seen a few weeks of story after story of man's heart. And even those who seem to be righteous, we know had sin. It's the nature of man, the nature of our heart. God in his mercy and his love sends Jesus Christ into our world to touch our heart, to transform our heart, to change us, Fortunately, it doesn't mean that we're perfect. But again, we have a changed heart, and God continues to change our heart. Some of you this morning, you need to give that heart to Jesus. You need to surrender your life to him. You've been doing it your way, just like they were doing in the story of the Tower of Babel. Let's do this for us. Let me live my life for us. Let's see what kind of a name I can make for myself instead of how can I bring glory to Jesus? How can I bring glory to God? They got their eyes on themselves. Some of you, your eyes have been on yourself for a long time and you've been trying to do it your own way. I would encourage you today is a day that you submit yourself to Jesus. You let him come in just as you are. You don't change yourself and then come to him. You come to him as you are. He washes you. He cleanses your heart. He touches your heart. He transforms your heart, your thinking. And he continues to do that. Because we, although we are saved in a moment, there is still this process of God working in our life and taking out some of the old junk that still wants to come back or still stays there. So it's that process. Some of you are dealing with that today. You recognize that maybe there's things that have creeped into your heart even as a follower of Christ. There's pain from the past. There's hurts. There's wounds. There's whatever. Jesus wants to touch your heart today and bring healing to you. I'm going to invite the worship team to come if they would. I want to pray with you today. If you need Jesus to touch your heart, you need to give your heart to Jesus right now. Would you raise up your hand real high? You need Jesus. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Are there? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for being real with God today. You can put your hands down. Is there anyone else today? Say, I need God to transform my heart. Listen, we're all in the same boat, right? We're all in the same boat. We all have a heart like this. Uh, the sins may be different, oftentimes they're the same, but we all need this. If you haven't done this, today's a great day to do that. Anybody else? You say, I need to give my heart to Jesus. I'm letting go of control of my life, and I'm submitting myself to God. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Yes, anyone else? Most Sundays we do this. We pray a prayer, and I'm going to help you to pray this prayer because I know some of you are like, I don't know how to pray. I'm gonna help you today. So I'm gonna just ask you to repeat the words I pray. It's not a magic formula. How many know we can say words and not mean them? But if you mean them, if you're sincere with God, God's gonna come and he's gonna give a brand new start today. He's gonna transform your life. Let's pray this. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me and sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. I do confess that I have sinned. 
But I now invite you to come into my heart. Transform my heart. And help me to live a life that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, I'm going to ask Mike and Irene if they would just, they'll meet you right up over here by this cross here. They just have a little booklet they want to give you that's going to begin to help you to grow in your faith journey, in your faith walk with God. I want you to just bow your heads again real quickly if you would. How many of you would say, Pastor Key, there are some things in my heart and I don't even know the extent of what's there. I haven't maybe even been able to put a finger on it, but I know because of the outcomes of my life and the choices I've been making that there's something there and I need God to heal that today. I need God to touch my heart. Some of you know exactly what's there. Some of you, again, you're, you're just not sure. But if you feel like, I, I need my heart changed, you're a follower of Jesus, but there's something there you need God to deal with today. And you just want to be honest before him, say, God, touch my heart, put a finger on it, heal me. Would you raise your hand this morning? Something you want to give God out of your heart. Yes, thank you. Thank you, many hands that are up. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray that you touch all of our hearts today. Lord, you see the hands of those saying, God, I need you. They may know exactly what's going on. They may have no idea what's buried in the depths of their hearts. But Lord, they need you to touch them today. God, I pray you'd begin that right now, that you would do in a moment what it seems as if it'd be a lifetime to take place. And it may seem a, it be a lifetime of things that have happened, but in a moment's time, you can touch and heal that heart and set them free. Father, do it right now, I pray in Jesus' name, out of your love, your compassion, your mercy for them. I'd like us to invite, I invite you to stand if you would, and we're gonna sing this song as we close in prayer. And I wanna just do this. I wanna open up the altars this morning. If you say, you know what? I just need to wait in God's presence. It's like taking a shower every day. I need to come into God's presence. Oh, Lord, clean me. I stink. I stinketh today, Lord. I just need to be in your presence. I need you to touch me and cleanse me and just wash me again today. And maybe that's you. I just want to invite you to come and just spend some time in his presence as we worship him. And then I'll come back and close after the song.
Hallelujah. Praise you, God. Hallelujah. I love that verse that says, who the Son sets free is free indeed. If you raise your hand earlier to accept Christ into your heart, again, Mike and Irene are our love machine couple. They'll meet you right over here. All right. <laughs> That's going to stick now. You know that, right? Let me pray God's blessing on you before you go. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every special and unique person in this place who has been created by you and for you. And Lord, you know in all of our hearts, we all deal with sin and temptation and things that we just don't even like are there. God, thank you that you haven't given up on us and you never will. Thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to bring healing to our hearts, to bring restoration there. And Father, I pray that you'd help us as we walk in obedience to you this week. And Lord, that we would take sin seriously. And if there's sin that we're living in right now, Lord, we confess it to you. But not just confess that, we repent of that. In other words, God, help us to turn away from that sin and the lies the enemy tells us about that sin and turn to the truth of your word and to walk in obedience to your word. May your word be a light that shines the way for our feet, Lord. Father, I pray you bless each one this week. Give them a great Lord's Day today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you. Thank you for being at Living Hope Church today.